welcome to the show, Vicky. Thanks very much for, for being a guest. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Um, so look, I, I think I found out of you through the advertising sort of circles. Um, I think I follow a couple of, of big people in the UK and obviously you're pretty prolific over there. So, um, but first things first, uh, we share a glass of uh, wine or, or beverage at the beginning. So uh, tell me a bit about which one you recommended that I try tonight. Oh, hey, hold on. I didn't recommend it. Oh, you've already opened yours. Um, yeah, sorry. Mine was uh, like a, a runner-up prize because I couldn't find um, a mini bottle of champagne. And I would have gone whole bottle, but it's 10 a.m. So I thought <laughs> one serve would be good and I will not operate clients afterwards or, or whatever the phrase is. Um, it might take me this whole time to open it. That's fine. I mean, um, I, I got the, the bigger bottle and... Um, oh, so you did? <laughs> yes. And then I, I finished uh, some exercise this afternoon. I thought, oh, I'll try this before, um, I hope you don't mind, uh, before the interview. Okay. And um, yeah, it was actually pretty nice. So um, Prosecco is really big in the UK though, right? Um, I think it's uh, less popular where I am. Um, tell me about sort of how it fits into the culture over there. Like it seems to be the, the bigger choice between champagne. Um, so I do have a wine expert friend who'll probably cringe if he listened to me trying to talk about um, wine and champagne. But uh, when I was younger, Prosecco used to be the cheaper option um, to champagne. And then I think uh, the Brits caught on to Europeans thinking that Prosecco is better than champagne, but mm -hmm. I'd always prefer champagne. Anyway, cheers. Yeah, cheers. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it's actually really quite fruity, very easy to drink. Pretty dangerous, actually. Yeah, it's a good morning drink. <laughs> <laughs> Just peps you up at uh, 10 a.m. in the morning. Um, <laughs> well, well, thanks for sharing it with me uh, in the morning. Um, have you had a coffee already, though? Or? No, I don't drink coffee, so I guess this is a replacement. But I do, I do get up really early when I've got loads of work on. So it's kind of like hot. It's like nearly lunchtime for me. And, you know, the old days of advertising, you'd go out for a champagne or martini, wouldn't you, at lunchtime? So... Let's pretend. Oh, those were the good old days, wasn't it? Ah, oh, jeez. Well, oh. I used to say the good old days. Now I'm going to get all political straight up. But uh, I've been reminded that it wasn't always good, um, i.e. sexism wasn't, um, wasn't a great experience. But in terms of work, I would say it was the good old days, yes. Mm. Yeah, there's a lot of money flowing around, wasn't it? So um, I think now everyone's like ROI focused and um, it's all digital. So it's all a bit transparent yeah. now. Yeah, more business than than pleasure. <laughs> That's it. Hey, so um, I actually listened to a couple of your podcasts and interviews. Um, but just for everyone else, just a really quick summary of like uh, who you are and um, maybe like one or two minutes max. Um, and and what you do. Yeah, just before I do, I think a big shout out to you because I don't think I've ever been invited to podcasts where the interviewer has done so much research, like all the. <laughs> back to me I was like wow um so thank you yeah no um, worries so uh what did you ask me oh dear oh, like, like just, just a quick summary of who you are and and and, and what you do just uh, just really quickly but I'll, I'll give an intro at the start of the podcast anyway okay well my intro is always my name's Vicky and I'm a copywriter and people who know me always say that's not enough to say to to sort of add up all the things that I do but I only ever wanted to be a copywriter and I only ever want to be known for being a copywriter uh, because I love my job and I um, I value and, and promote and respect the craft as you know um, but I suppose a few more things is I mentor young female creatives uh, I teach at an advertising school in London um, and I created a hashtag, Copywriters Unite, on uh, Twitter to connect copywriters around the world, but also for copywriters to support each other and commiserate with each other, but also celebrate each other, because quite often they're working on their own, and I wanted there to be a place for, for them to be able to talk to each other. Um, and the hashtag became so popular that it turned into um, real-life meetups. Uh, so I host quarterly meetups in London. When we're all allowed out, we should note we're recording this in various stages of lockdown. Um, so yeah, four in London, and then I have hosts uh, around the world who ho uh, who host their own nights. So it's gone as far as uh, Australia, I believe. So I'm really excited by that. 
That's great. I, I think you, you definitely give back to the community and, uh, you know, I, I think kudos to you because a lot of people don't do that. Um, it's easy to sort of whinge about it, but to do something is, is the next step. So I think that's really great. And um, I think uh, also you're very supportive of me. Uh, I'll just thank you as well because uh, I, I did my list and there was a bit of a gender imbalance and pulled myself up on it. And um, then I thought, okay, who do I know? And my social circles weren't as good in the professional scene um, in some areas. Um, so yeah, thanks for, thanks for accepting. Um, I, I know it took me a little while, but, um, yeah, thank you a lot. No, no problem. I think, um, like I never want to be that guy, <laughs> um, <laughs> or girl, obviously. Um, but in the climate that we're in particularly right now, it, it's so easy to do the right thing. Um, and all it takes is just to ask the question, you know, have you thought about adding uh, diversity to your list and then uh, you know the person at the other end of that question has never intended maliciously to not have a diverse list um, sometimes they just need a reminder so yes I am that guy girl <laughs> oh, that's good it's like um, it's like convenient sampling right like uh, that's, that's basically what I was doing I went through my list of connections and they were already sort of leaning to one side so then yeah. you go through that and then subconsciously you you, you have to um, you just go along with it unless you pull yourself up so yeah, I think also like it, it's easy for me to do because I'm such a huge fan of so many people in the industry because I love my job. The, these names come to mind for me and they might not come to mind for others. So I'm happy to just roll them out and, and get them the attention that they deserve. That's great. Um, okay, so my first question is, um, I know your specialty in copywriting is like tone and voice, uh, branding and tone and voice, but I don't really want to talk about uh, copywriting because I know people ask you all the time, you know, what's a good way to copyright this and that and that's tactical and, and I like that but um, I want to ask you other questions. Um, so and um, I suppose I really want to hone down on like the value of copywriting because when we get down to the tactical level of execution, um, sometimes it's looked down upon as a bit lower brow, you know, the manager sits at the top and does the macro strategy and then um, sometimes the value of those small tactical tweaks can be, you know, very high, but fly under the radar. So I want to ask you um, about that today. Um, but before we get into that, um, how would you describe what copywriting is to someone really succinctly and simply? Words that sell. Okay, I like that. <laughs> you weren't expecting it to be that succinct. Um, Perfect. So I hate writing long copy. I love writing headlines. Like, uh, you know, five words max is all I've got in me, really. <laughs> um, so words that sell. But to expand on that, um, they are words that copywriting is words that go on a website or on packaging or in an email or on a billboard. And their, um, their intent is to encourage the reader of those words to act preferably buy, but often it's click or share or download, but preferably buy to make the brand money. Great. Okay. So as opposed to other forms of writing, what, what isn't copywriting? What does it get confused with? Um, oh God, trademarking. I mean, I think every copywriter has been asked if they're a lawyer. Um, <laughs> but, but bringing it back to a closer uh, a closer industry. I, I think storytelling is, is a buzzword of late and I think that is maybe diluting the purpose of copywriting. Um, yes, we have to uh, create a connection with the reader and make them feel something, but we still do have to make them act at the end of it. We can't just sort of present information and wrap it up in a nice story with no call to action if our copywriting is to encourage sales. Yeah, I see uh, CTAs or you know, call to actions are uh, getting dropped off all the time. And I think this uh, storytelling comes from some of the tech, you know, branding community where um, there's a couple of people I won't mention, but, you know, everyone's trying to sell their own angle, aren't they? But um, yeah, for me, I'm definitely with you. It's like, if it doesn't work, it doesn't have an outcome. There's no much point in it, is there? It's just a nice story to read. <laughs> exactly. But also, I think um, there's a combination of copywriting not being respected often and copywriters trying to sell themselves as something else to make sure that their work is valued and as such they call copywriting something else and I'm not really a fan of that because I think you know in because uh, I'm always on about brand consistency if copywriting is a brand then we should stay true to the story that we tell of copywriting and if we're blurring the lines and calling ourselves storytellers or worse things that I've seen like um, verbal identity creators 
or verbal designers that doesn't help either so yeah i'd really like it if we all just stuck to calling ourselves copywriters yeah well the same thing happens with marketing like um silicon valley didn't like it so that it got rebadged into growth you know so like i i find these terms that <laughs> they're, they're an old proposition that is rebadged and and um, rebranded into a, a new term you know that's that's the flavor of the month or year so yeah, yeah. maybe that's what's happened to copywriting Afraid so. <laughs> um, so, what about uh, the longevity of um, just just two weeks ago? Um, GP, GPT three came out, which is um, Elon Musk's open AI um, script writing engine for for language processing. Um, so, basically, you could put in a couple of parameters of what you want the program to talk about, and it would just flesh out this uh, this written prose. Right? Um, did you have a check of that? And what do you think is that a threat to the future of, of copywriting? Um, right. Okay. So no, I didn't look into it because I thought you'd just sent me some marketing jargon to consider. <laughs> and I thought I'd, it would come out in the wash as we were talking today, which it now has. Um, but I do have thoughts on that. I, I actually gave a talk in Mumbai last year at a conference called Z Melt or, and it was called the robots aren't coming. Um, and I did, I mean, I spent about three months researching it and there's just no way a copy, uh, sorry, a robot can write better than a copywriter. Um, they might be able to do some of the sort of ring stuff that requires a, a template and a structure and that could take away from copywriters, but that could be a good thing because I think most copywriters love their job and love the creativity of it. So it enables them to keep the creativity. But what I found was, um, some some of the best writing comes from a personal experience or emotion and robots haven't experienced anything and they don't have emotions so they can't draw on that to tell a good story um and you can't program them to have feelings um so i think we're okay there yeah uh, i think it's a good point yeah <laughs> hit the nail on the head for the for sure so um yeah i found the same like when i looked at some of the examples of, of this um this engine that people had been given the beta to um it was it was technically sort of correct but it, there's no the context was lacking like the 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 way that it would structure from start to finish there was sort of no uh, story behind it or reasons why it was just it was just prose you know stuck together like linguistically and grammatically it was it was fine um but it, it was just like as if a robot had created an article, for example. Yeah, I mean, that's the other thing. It, it will write in a straight line, but it won't find a way to go off and add humor or a play on words or, like I said, a personal reference. So it will work for some things, but not others. So I'm not worried. Uh, yeah. I think also uh, there seems to be so many copywriter jobs going at the moment and social media jobs going. Um, you know, during the pandemic, businesses have moved their operations online. And so we're needing to write to consumers more than we did before. Um, and so copywriters, uh, they might not be feeling it right now, but if they just hang on, I think that, that you know, we're very much in demand um, as long as we're valued for doing the job in the first place and marketers don't, you know, in a, in a budget saving exercise, say they'll do the copy themselves, which oh my angers God. me. Or, or clients themselves who try and convince you otherwise. Um, okay, that gives me a, a good point because I want to ask you this. Um, and I use the analogy of like everyone goes to restaurants so they naturally think they can run a restaurant. Until they open the restaurant, they figure out, oh, wow, that's really hard. And it's like hyper competitive. Um, I, I find that it's the same about copywriting. When I first started, I'm like, oh, how hard going to be? Then you, you're faced with this blank template and you go, oh, how do I do this? And then suddenly you're, you're researching other competitors and trying to draw something together and because you've never written that style before, it's actually quite hard. Um, so I, I feel sometimes people don't value the profession because everyone can write. Um, so what would you say to that? So I always say everyone can write, but not everyone can write copy. Um, there's a difference between writing a marketing or a strategy deck and writing a piece of copy that has to go out to a consumer. Um, there are tricks and techniques that a copywriter knows that a non-copywriter doesn't. And those tricks and techniques are uh, to make a uh, copy succinct um, or to make it make the reader feel something or to give it a bit of rhythm so it's, it's enjoyable and flows right. Um, and, and I don't want to pinpoint marketers, but just for shorthand, marketers don't know all of those tricks and techniques. Um, you know, they might repeat something in a piece of copy just because they forgot they already wrote it 
earlier on in the piece, whereas copywriters use repetition as a, as a technique to make the customer remember something, but it's done in a different way. Um, and, and like copywriters would always tell you they've been in a meeting with a marketer stroke client and uh, and they'll just question pieces of copy because they'll base it on their English degree that they did at university and copywriting is not proper formal English it's totally different it's a conversation it's a dialogue so it should feel more natural and and it shouldn't be attached to the formalities that we were all taught at school or if we went to university I didn't but at university so things like uh, you know using full words you like do not or we can you would use contractions to make it feel more conversational so don't and can't um, and uh, like a favorite is um, people who have English degrees love saying you can't start a sentence with and whereas actually or that's but. a really good technique or but or because or any of those <laughs> but they're really good techniques for helping copy go especially when you've got a lot to say you know it's funny you say that because um after this podcast I then have to listen to it all right and transcribe it and um then I found a, a more automated way of doing that right so uh, once once I put the conversation through those systems and and it comes out and you see the text on the page you're like oh wow that like looks really bad because <laughs> it's so informal and spontaneous and you know you use the wrong words out of context you repeat yourself all the time so I completely understand where you're coming from there but it wasn't until I did that, that I was like oh wow that's the way people really talk yeah and it yeah. feels more natural and it's not right you know um I guess you have to be careful with that that's not that's a broad rule but it's not true for everything so um if you were a scientist writing to another scientist in a in a piece of communication um that would be how scientists have conversations so there's a different conversation going on and depending on the copywriter's approach and audience yeah yeah i agree um so uh, speaking of that then maybe um you don't have enough money to hire an experienced copywriter or you have a team that's a bit junior um what are the sort of red flags or telltale signs of of a copywriter who maybe is at the start of their journey um versus someone like yourself who would be at the other end of this sort of experience spectrum um when i was a junior and thought i was good I mean, I was, because oh, I wouldn't have got to where I am now. But, you know, you look back and you see the old stuff and you're like, wow, I wrote that. Um, but as a junior, you're excited and you want to get romantic. And, you know, I worked in beauty for eight years, uh, starting as a junior copywriter. So there was lots of opportunity to get romantic. But, you know, you don't have to say everything all at once. Sometimes the the key outtake is in what what you don't say like let the reader breathe and let the reader you know work some things out for themselves don't make them work hard but you know give them a bit of uh, credit for having their own intelligence um and then there are just words that you can't help putting in you know that is a word you can always take out you know i'm writing to tell you that it's hot today you can just say i'm writing to tell you it's hot today but then I've just tripped myself up because if you're writing something to someone, you don't need to say I'm writing to tell you because that it's evident in the fact that they are reading a piece of your writing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I guess it's knowing what to take out um, and when to stop. Okay. And, and not using jargon. And maybe like, uh, I mean, I'm just learning here, but active and passive voice, you know, we, we come across this a lot in the website world. So overuse of one or the other, is that another sign or? Yes, thank you. Um, junior copywriters love the passive voice. I don't think they know that they love it. I think that it's an easy default because I think in their head when they're learning, they're thinking, what shouldn't I say? And then they say the thing that they shouldn't, um, which is very hard to follow through when you're writing a billboard campaign, for example, because you don't have long to get someone's attention. So tell them what they want to know, what the, the, not what they don't want to know. And it's funny. Yeah, look, I found the same thing when I was trying to distill when I work with tech companies and, you know, they, they have this product, it does lots of things. And it's really hard to distill all that down into like one common uh, proposition or in a sentence. And, you know, the elevator pitch, for example, um, that took me hours and hours and hours of like, okay, what's the core thing that brings everything together? Um, and it was the shortest piece of copy ever, but it took the longest. So <laughs> do you find the same? Like is some people trying to value copywriting based on the length of, of the, the copy that they receive as opposed to maybe the core? quality or the impact it, it may have 
I haven't experienced that personally, but I do know that um, companies do try and charge by the word or comment on how copy couldn't have taken the copyright along if it's only three lines, but three lines can take a day if you're, you know, working through what those three lines need to be. But uh, just to your earlier point about having lots to say, sometimes copywriting can just be a way of presenting the facts and the information in a memorable way and not in a, in a longer piece if you don't have the space. So for example, Apple, um, I think it's for their mobile or the or one of their products, I'm sorry, I can't remember. Actually, maybe it's their camera. Um, rather than say the camera is capable of doing 10 different things and then describing each of them, they just uh, use repetition and alliteration to get the facts and the benefits across. And it's something like flip it, snap it, twirl it, you know, uh, catch uh -huh. it. And it just goes on for about eight times, eight repeats. And that just makes the reader smile and get the benefits straight away. Yeah, and it's funny. Um, the they do the same with the new watch ad, the Apple Watch. Um, they Maybe they go the feature, 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 feature all the way through all the different use cases, and right at the end, it's like, and it's just really a watch. And that's the thing <laughs> that you remember out of everything else. Like it's like you forget the first part of the ad, and then you go, oh yeah, it is a watch. <laughs> yeah. And then you think about the features afterwards, and you're like, oh, that's a really clever way of doing it. You know, everyone yeah. else does it the opposite way around. You know, this is the product feature, 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 feature. You know, buy it now. Yeah. Um, I found that really cool too. So um, I suppose we're talking about like good copywriting here and how you measure it. Um, so like obviously some of the copywriting you do um, is on the brand level, um, which may be in a less, um, how would I say, sales transactional kind of use case. Um, so how do you, how would you assess good copy from bad copy or how do you measure it or put a value on it if, if an executive's asking you and, or you're trying to justify your, your, your rate, for example? Um, I don't really have a good answer for this, I'm afraid, because I'm a consultant now and I'm not exposed to all of the information that would give me those answers, uh, but I used to be. So, um, for example, when I worked at Expedia, they tested everything all the time. Every day, copy was tested uh, and design, etc. cetera. Um, and so we would always respond to whatever those figures were. Um, and um where so else like this have... is in a website setting or like an app setting so you can directly measure before and after a split test that kind of thing right yes and yeah. you know where the reader looks first and is their eye drawn to the call to action button should the call to action button be red should the copy on the call to action button be on brand or should it be a straight transactional piece of copy that says something like buy now mm -hmm. um and so then that's where my branding area comes in so by now or, or other straight and more direct pieces of copy on a call to action button do in test respond far better um, than or, or, or work far better than uh, than a branded piece of copy. So, for example, Virgin uh, Holidays, they'll say uh, when you're reading about a holiday that you might be interested in the call to action button, instead of saying book now or view more or find out more, it will say save me a spot or I'm there or can't wait. And uh what was i saying yes yeah, sorry so the direct buttons respond better when a brand doesn't have a distinct tone of voice and brand personality but when a brand like virgin atlantic does and the customer is used to them speaking in that way consistently on everything they expect the buttons to speak to them in that way too so they respond in the same way i'm told um whereas if they'd flipped and they'd gone direct which would be a break in their brand consistency and tone of voice customers could react negatively because suddenly it feels like somebody else is talking to them it feels a bit more formal maybe legals got involved and suddenly you're not enjoying the experience that you were first experiencing yeah so it's quite interesting and also good for me to be able to bang on about it when i'm always trying to push for brand consistency with all the brands i work <laughs> with that dreaded legal department hey it's just the bane of my existence sometimes you know <laughs> well, i actually i love working with the legal department <laughs> which i think makes me such a geek um <laughs> i had a really good experience with the first lawyer i ever worked with and that was when i worked at the body shop so in beauty you can't actually claim that anything does anything because it doesn't like no cream can get rid of wrinkles. You need plastic surgery for that. But lots of products say it. Um, and so I worked with a great um, lawyer from L'Oreal 
Um, and he just got marketing and I got what his issues were. So when I said, we want to say X, he'd say, you can't say that, but you can say this. And we just had a really good relationship working through things. But some other legal departments, um, well, I don't know. I've never had a bad experience. They always get it. I think sometimes it's the marketing people in between. Sorry, I'm having a right bash at marketers. Well, um, I hate those marketers. Terrible people. <laughs> I don't hate marketers. They give me lots of work. Um, <laughs> But sometimes the legal team can tell the marketing team that you can't say something for legal reasons. And rather than work with the legal team to find out what you can say, marketing will just come straight back to the copywriter and say, no, legal said no. And that's their like, get out, just blame uh, it on legal. So instead of so going, always, here's the context and there's the confines or this is what not exactly. to do list. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So I always say, can you let me speak with legal, please? Um, in fact, you and I had to rearrange this call because I had to speak with legal about something oh. the other day. Um, okay, well, so, that's a good excuse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. So like, um, we're talking a bit about here the, the barriers to really good copywriting. Um, is, is that one of the barriers you see? Like legality, obviously. Um, but I, I, I work a lot in projects as well and multiple people with different interests. And um, what do you see as the biggest barriers to really good copywriting in, in the modern era? Um, well, at the briefing stage, you know, there's the classic piece on a brief that says um, what the, the key message is or the one USP. And it's always filled in with like six different points rather than one. And it's because you've got lots of people feeding in and they've all got their, like you say, like their areas to cover. And as a copywriter, you only want to say one thing. If you can't say one thing clearly and you're saying lots of things in a muddled way, then the customer, the reader won't know what to do. So it's hard to get um, people at the you know, pre-briefing stage to agree on what the piece of communication needs to do. That's the first hurdle, I suppose. Um, but then in the approval process, I guess you, you have to rely on the person who's reviewing the work to really get what good copy looks like. So for example, I wrote a TV ad last month and it started with like a, an opening line that was just gonna stay on the frame for it and live on its own. And then after a beat, it was gonna be followed with uh, going into further copy to explain what that opening line said. But the person reviewing it said that the first line didn't connect to the second line and could you just add the word and to bridge the two and that's, that's not how copywriting works. You don't just stick a word in to bridge two lines together. Like they have to flow. And, and the and in that case didn't work. It often does, but it didn't in that case. And that's just not, I don't know, not reading it out loud, not getting the full picture. Um, and also, I suppose if you're going to feedback on copy, do just that. Give feedback. Don't try and rewrite it yourself. Let the copywriter do it. Like the copywriters come at it from a certain point of view. You can't just stick words in where you feel like it. It happened to me just yesterday. Um, I wrote an article. Um, Congratulations. <laughs> ten, yeah, 10 interviews, you know, with 10 different business owners. And then one of them <laughs> rewrote the whole passage. Everyone else said, oh, yeah, that's great. Um, maybe just change this capital because this is my brand name. And, you know, I forgot to put a capital in. Or, oh, actually, this is, you know, one word change. One guy, you know, 200 words rewritten and completely. And just the whole style and the flow of the whole piece just stopped. And I'm like, oh, yeah. what are you doing? <laughs> Yeah, let me do that. But, yeah. um, but that's a good point, though. So I, I always say that clients should feedback on, um, on the facts. If I've got facts wrong, um, educate me on, on what the facts are so that I get them right. But let me work out how I put them together in a piece of copy. Yeah, I, li I like that answer. That's really good. Um, here's a bit of a Peter Thiel question, right? Um, he's, he's the PayPal sort of guy and billionaire in Silicon Valley. Um, he asked this to employees, but he says, you know, what's something about your discipline of copywriting that most people believe in, but which you know to be wrong? So is that an orthodox kind of view about copywriting that everyone thinks that it should be done this way and you found out in your experience actually the opposite is true or, or um, sort of common? No, I think it is just that everyone thinks that they can do it and that it's easy. And it is easy for copywriters it isn't easy for non-copywriters. I mean, there are some, obviously, people have a flair. Um, but yeah, I think the, the general rule for me would be everyone can write, but not everyone can write copy. 
Okay. And you mentioned in, uh, when I did my research that you're a better writer than a speaker, but I think you speak quite well, <laughs> like on this interview, there's nothing wrong. Yeah, I did campaign. Um, yeah. Is, I, that, is that because the Prosecco or something or? Yeah, maybe. Um, I just feel when I'm talking that I just waffle and I lose my way and, um, yeah, you know, doing it now. <laughs> um, whereas with writing, that's in private. You can't see what I'm deleting and trying again with. But yeah, on stage uh, or even talking with you in what would seem, you know, intimate and relaxed. Yeah, I just get a bit nervous. Well, I have to say I'm kind of the same. Like if, if someone asks me a question uh, and sometimes I think this comes with depth of knowledge. If, if they ask you a really general question, you have a lot of knowledge. It's like, how do I frame that in a way? Uh, in a way that's conversational that they'll understand um, or, or just you know it takes me a little while to think about what's the best way to answer that that question um, or frame it um, so yeah uh, I completely you know hear you on that one yeah I mean I did a I recorded a podcast a couple of months ago and I listened to it when it went live and I mean I take about three days to answer some of the questions and they didn't even edit it so I, I just it's evident that I uh, need time to myself to be able to come out with a good line <laughs> nice. I like that. Um, so what are some of the funniest moments you, you've had in, in your career so far? Um, anything that sort of stands out as really quirky or funny? Um, I can't think of anything like hilarious, but I've, I've had some, I've had a lot of fun. I've been on loads of trips that I never thought as a copywriter I would get to go on. I thought copywriters just sat behind their computer screen and, and wrote words and never spoke to anyone and never went anywhere. Um, but I don't know, maybe I've got lucky, but I've been around the world with my job um, and on photo shoots and to premieres and I've met celebrities and um, I, you know, as I said, like just really unexpected. I, I never thought any of those things would happen, but probably my biggest moment in my career that was, uh, like incredibly unexpected was I went to Kensington Palace last year to meet Prince Harry and Meghan Markle about writing their website. Wow, that's that's a big uh, <laughs> boast right there. <laughs> I know, I've never actually told anyone that. <laughs> <laughs> that's insane. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure you can't talk about it either. But um, that's that's a big one. And weren't you involved with Michael Jackson's um, album or something? Is that correct? Oh yeah, that makes it sound like I knew him, which I didn't. No, 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 at a very tiny level. Um, in my job hopping before becoming a copywriter, one of my jobs was um, office admin assistant at a PR agency and they were putting on the um, album launch party uh, for that Michael Jackson blood on the dance floor. So I licked envelopes and stamps and I went to the party. That's, that's yeah, that's you mean, the closest. You mean you wrote copy, right? No, no <laughs> words said. <laughs> <laughs> that was before um, I was a copywriter, but desperately trying to be one somewhere. Oh, it's, it's a good claim, though. So, um, wow, that's, that's two pretty uh, big celebs right there, or three. Yeah, well, I was very excited about Megan because I watched, this, um, I watched Suits religiously, um, whereas I didn't have a huge interest in the royal family. But then I guess I was swayed because Prince Harry was an a utter delight. <laughs> no, that's great. And um, Suits, like, I watched that as well. Um, I really like the, um, the way they... Uh, you know, it's just lawyer banter, but the way they frame um, moments within uh, when they're negotiating with each other and sort of how they screw each other over. I thought that was really mm -hmm. clever the way they use words and that. Like, I'm, yeah. I'm sure some pretty experienced writers were writing for that film, of uh, that, that series. Mm. Yeah, it was a good show. What books are you reading on copywriting that you'd recommend other people read? Or it doesn't have to be uh, copywriting, could be just something to do with your, your professional sort of career. Well, I mean, uh, copywriters should read anything and everything. And I mean it, like even the pizza delivery leaflet or the poster in the doctor's surgery, anything. Um, but books on copywriting, I always recommend Steve Harrison's How to Write Better Copy. Mm -hmm. He's a copywriter. I mean, he's far more than that. He's multi, multi award winning and extremely successful in advertising and direct marketing. Uh, but copywriters write the best books and um, he writes it conversationally. And I mean, I read it in two hours. It's, it's great. Um, junior by Thomas Kemeny is a great book for junior copywriters, but I would say senior copywriters could learn from it too. It's also a really enjoyable read, again, written by a copywriter. And then my favorite um, recent book that I read was uh, by Bernice Fitzgibbon, who was a, the highest paid copywriter in the 40s, and her book is called Macy's Gimbal and Me. 
And then one more, <laughs> um, I would recommend Mary Wells Lawrence's A Big Life in Advertising. Um, she was a copywriter, but it's not about copywriting. It's about her life in advertising, obviously, and um, and some of the huge success that she had and the major turnarounds that she uh, made within brands. And I just read it thinking, oh my God, how do I get a brain like that? Wow. Yeah. Look, um, I know two of those books, but the other two, that's perfect. Um, I'm definitely going to read some of those, especially Steve Harrison's because it's two hours. So I'm guessing a short book, right? Um, not, not like majorly short, just so easy to read. You just bounce from page to page. Hmm. Um, it reminds me of, um, like Marty Neumeyer. He's a branding guy in, um, I think it's San Jose or San Diego. Um, and it was a very visual sort of small book on what a brand is and what it isn't. And I just really like the way he told that story. So, um, that's one back at you if, if you haven't read that one already. No, I, think I haven't. The, the brand gap or something. I think it's cool. Cool. Yeah, so you can give it to any executive who goes, oh, what is a brand? And then they kind of, they read the book and they go, oh, I get it. You know, I don't get the, all the nuances, but I understand. Well, that's great because I don't, uh, I haven't read many books on branding as such. So that would be good. Mm. Um, favorite website or resource? Google. Google? Okay, that's, it. that's easy. <laughs> what about um, favorite piece of tech that you can't do without that helps you do your job better? Uh, my laptop. I'm I'm not a tech person. I can pretty much only use a Word document, so my laptop is fine. Okay, so it's not a moleskin with like an ink pen or something? Or... No, in meetings I do write notes, but when it comes to writing copy, it's straight to the computer. Nice. Um, what about uh, something you want to promote? So Copywriters Unite, you mentioned. Is there anything else sort of close to heart that you want to sort of give a plug out for? Or? Uh, yes, please. Um, so Women in Marketing have just launched their awards competition this year. They're in their 10th year. And this year they added a copywriting category, which I'm Ooh. delighted about, um, especially as other competitions have removed their copywriting categories. Although I'm told that's temporary, but they shouldn't have done it in the first place. Um, and what's great about it is there are no barriers to entry, unless you're a man, <laughs> um, but it's for women anywhere and everywhere to enter. The entry fee is, is half the price of all the other categories in the competition, but also just crazy low compared to other competitions. Um, you don't have to get your agency's permission. You don't have to create a, a case study or a film. Um, it just needs to be a piece of copy that has gone out in the last year and it will be judged purely on the craft, not the sales figures, not the uplift or increase in response, none, none of that, just writing. Wow, that's, that's great. Um, I like that sort of no approval thing as well. That makes it easy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. I think also if you're a freelancer, often um, your work or what you worked on at an agency will be entered into an award and you won't be credited for it because you're not a member of staff, but this allows you to do that yourself. Oh, yes. Good point. Good point. Yeah. It's the uh, classic taking uh, credit for other people's work that happens in agency land all the time. <laughs> yeah. Well, not just in agency land, you know, on social media too. I have, like, I have a real issue with people not crediting others because especially in the creative world, your work is your currency mm. and you deserve to be credited for it. It amazes me that people have so much time to just sort of lift an idea or a meme or a piece of work from someone else's tweet or LinkedIn post or whatever, and then share it as their own. I don't get that. Why would yeah. you do that? It happens on Instagram all the time as well. Uh, and Twitter, actually. Like, um, I, I don't think a lot of people realize that the person behind a lot of famous celebs Twitter accounts is a copywriter, you know? Um, they don't yeah. have time to post all that stuff. <laughs> you might yeah. get the occasional, like, inebriated kind of weird tweet, you know, from the person themselves, but the rest <laughs> is, is curated, right? It's someone's job. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, what's, uh, let's say someone really connected with um, what we're talking about tonight. I know it's a pretty a quick one, um, but uh, what's the best way for someone to contact you? Maybe ask you a question. I know you're really popular, but best channel. Um, yeah, I'm happy for people to contact me about copywriting anytime. Um, I, and I'm not shy with my email address. So that's Vicky Ross writes at mail.com or um, yeah, I'm on Twitter banging on about copy all the time uh, and I'm on LinkedIn. Perfect. Okay. Now that's really good. I mean, I, I see you on Twitter a lot and uh, some of the stuff you, you raise is really good. Like it's quite entertaining. So um, <laughs> the, the occasional sort of like, you know, pet gripe in the copywriting industry. Um, but I'm sure that happens all the time. So um, yeah, look, um, I just want to thank you for your time. I'm, I'm conscious of, of the time here and you've got to go. So um, 
thanks uh, again uh, for the time uh, and you know, cheers to the Prosecco. That was, was really good.